Welcome back, everybody, to another edition of Ask Mike. Courtney Mims alongside Mike Irwin yeah, here. First time to do this with you, so you better get it right. Oh, my goodness. What? <laughs> what? I, I will get it right, Mike. I will I get it right. Expect your input and <laughs> ask good questions. Definitely, definitely. We, we have the first question and obviously have a lot of basketball ones this week for Mike. We start off with two questions about the Hogs win over New Mexico State in Buffalo. Pig's Feet asks, was that the ugliest game you have ever seen? I mean, I'm tickled that we won and are headed to the Sweet 16, but surely we could never shoot that badly in a game again, could we? And then there's a second question. And there is a second question. You're right. I didn't know if you wanted me to ask yeah. both of them to you, Mike. I'll respond to both of them. All right. Sounds good. And the Hog Hawkins wants to know, how did we win that game against New Mexico State? I know defense is important, but the offense, flat awful. Charles Barkley and the other TV guys kept talking about how awful it was, and it wasn't just because of the defense. Okay. It was because of the defense. <laughs> and it's not just me saying that. We just came back from Nolan Richardson. We Correct. visited with him for about an hour. He, he said that. He watched that game. He said the ugly offense was a product of the defense, which was so good, and he knows a lot about defense. Exactly. Uh, here's the thing about it. Uh, when you're <clears throat> playing two teams like that that are both playing defense, it forces you into weird situations. And Musselman said in order to stop their really good shooting guard, uh, we had to ch go to a defense, an NBA-style defense that we hadn't run before. And it threw us off a little bit offensively. You know, Eddie, Eddie Sutton used to complain to his players. He'd say, you guys are so interested in what happens on the offensive end of the floor, it makes your defense <laughs> bad. Well, honestly, the opposite is also true. If you spend that amount of time focusing on defense, it will affect your offense. So I think... I, you know, I'm, I didn't play basketball like Charles Barkley, but Nolan was a coach and knows a lot about defense, and I'll go with Nolan and what he said. Now, let's look at some of the things that happened there. Because you're right, 53 points uh, won't win many games, but while fans were focusing on missed shots, J.D. Note was setting an Arkansas NCAA tournament record of eight steals in a game. Some of those steals led to points on the other end. Then there was Jalen Williams setting an Arkansas NCAA tournament record of 15 boards in a game. Now, you think of all the great players that have played under Eddie and Nolan, and these two guys set two records in the same game. That's impressive. And then there was Audis Tony. He held uh, Teddy Allen, their guard, to 12 points. The kid scored 37 against UConn, and overall, uh, New Mexico State scored 70 points against UConn and just 48 against Arkansas. Now, let's take a look at that bad offense. <laughs> a four-minute stretch just before halftime, Arkansas outscored New Mexico State 10-2. to In a two-minute stretch of the second half, 8.06 to 6.07 left in the game, Hogs went on a 9-0 run from one down to up by eight. Those six, six minutes on the clock gave the Aggies just enough of a pad that they were forced to come back and try to foul lately or gave Arkansas enough of a pad that they were, uh, the Aggies were forced to foul late. And it was a three-point game with 118 left. And at that point, Arkansas went seven of eight from the free throw line. Last time I checked, free throws are offense. And that offense, that decided the game right there. So there's an answer to both of those questions because we, we've seen a lot of that lately. People going, oh, it was an ugly game. It was terrible. Oh, yeah. They, they were all over Twitter um, talking all throughout the game. I was watching, you know, seeing the fan comments. Right. And it was a lot, hey, this is ugly. I want to turn off my TV. And you're going, don't turn off the TV. You, you want to watch some good defense, you go back to that game. And even Coach Musselman said, I, I prepared these guys with all these defensive packages, right? Yep. You, you just said it. We prepared these guys so well for the defense that offense. it affected their offense. Exactly, Mike. Well, let's move on to the next question. David Simon says, I couldn't agree more about the defense, but the outside shooting woes of this team have to be a concern. Great D can only carry them so far. At some point, they're going to have to score some real points. And I think what people are concerned about is the Gonzaga game. If you score 53 points, they don't figure you can beat those guys. But it will be a totally different kind of a game. Yeah. You are going from being the hunted, which Arkansas was in both of those <laughs> games, to being the hunter. And the hunter is all, all, always more aggressive. So I'm not going to worry too much about, I think they were 14 of 51. 
and three for 16 from the three-point range. Yeah. I don't think they'll do that against Gonzaga. I think it's a totally different kind of game, and I think uh, you look at some of the scoring they've done. Let's take a look at that. Oh. These, are, these are scoring. This is scoring Arkansas did against teams with similar talent to Gonzaga. Maybe not quite as good, but yeah, everybody yeah. would agree. <laughs> uh, Auburn, Tennessee, maybe not Kentucky. They, they have the talent. They just didn't play up to it. Or, I'm sorry, t LSU didn't. T Kentucky's all good. Arkansas scored plenty of points. The Tennessee game here was the only one where they, you know, in the 50s. Yeah. I think they were up in the 70s against Tennessee at Tennessee. So, looking at those games, I don't see there's any evidence that to suggest that they're going to get into a game with Gonzaga and just start, you know, missing shots and scoring 48 or 50 right. points. Right. So I, I just, I'm not worried about it myself. Yeah, well, it's a totally different game, totally different opponent. And you brought up that graphic right there, Mike, and it's funny to see that all those names, all those teams, those guys aren't in this tournament anymore. Who's the last one left in the SEC? Exactly. It's, exactly. So let's move on to the next question. T.L. Slayton says, I can't believe some of the stuff I'm reading on Facebook about Arkansas and their win last Saturday. Three seasons under Musselman, and some of these fans are getting so spoiled that they care more about style points than winning. First of all, I would say that's just a few of the fans. <laughs> They're the ones that make all the noise and mm -hmm. you notice it. But a yeah. lot of the stuff I'm reading is very positive. Here's the question. You already said it. <laughs> Do you think that any of those fans of those other teams, Auburn, Tennessee, Kentucky, LSU, any of them, Alabama was in the tournament, you think they wouldn't trade places with Arkansas right now and well, have an ugly win and well, still be playing? I think they playing? want to be where we are right now. Yeah, so <laughs> and, and I do think Part of the problem here is, again, some people just watch offense. Right. To them, offense is a three-point shot mm -hmm. or a dunk. Yeah. Or, and defense to them is a steal, which leads to a dunk. <laughs> but they don't watch Audis Tony chase, you know, this guy, Teddy, what's his oh, name? Yeah, all Teddy over, Allen. All, man. Teddy Ooh. Allen all over the floor during a, the, the 20 second. 25 seconds of the shot clock until it's going down and just chasing him everywhere and watching him go in and out and try everything. <laughs> he was giving through, him fits. Through picks and he's going through there and going all around and then he has to get, do a fall away NBA three and misses it. Sometimes yeah. he didn't even get the ball in a possession. Mm -hmm. And so when you watch something like that and you're able to see it, you're able to enjoy this so-called ugly game. Yeah, and, and when we look at highlights as well, you know, you, you, you've got to blame some of this uh, I want to watch offense on the highlights. Everyone wants to watch exactly. them make buckets. They're not buckets. going to sit there and show in the highlights, yeah. you know, Audie's <laughs> Tony chasing him for 25 <laughs> seconds. I've watched it. I would watch it too, Mike. And it's I just, would watch you, it too. You put yourself in his position, and he's got to be thinking, when is this guy going to – he's he's just all over me. I, I can't breathe. I don't, sometimes <laughs> when is he going to let up? Sometimes he was denied the ball. Didn't yes. even get the ball yeah. in the possession. Or, or made bad passes because of Turnover. Tony's guarding. Yeah, so exactly. Definitely. Uh, posting – after the win over Vermont, Tamara Danner Melton said SEC refs look better after seeing these tonight. Thank goodness they got the last review right. What I've noticed is if, if you watch this whole basketball season, it, it looks like to me the SEC refs had kind of a mandate from the conference to let them play more. <laughs> yeah, fewer okay. Fewer flat I fouls. Could see that. Because, I mean, I saw some obvious fouls throughout the season that weren't called. It didn't matter who the team was. They just were they were letting them play. Yes. When we got into the NCAA tournament, we're seeing them be more picky. Fouls, right. the, the contact that wasn't a foul in SEC play, SEC tournament, is a foul in the NCAA tournament. Right. So that part of it is explainable to me, mm -hmm. just the difference in the philosophy. All right. About the, the reviews that came out at the end, there was an earlier review where a ball was ruled off of Arkansas and it was a critical possession yes. but and you went back and looked and it was obvious what they were looking at yeah. and they still you know still didn't rule in Arkansas's favor and you're going what well, how do you look at that right. that many times and see that he didn't touch the ball so you get angry about that but when they came back on that really critical possession with Note over in the corner which I don't remember the score but Arkansas needed the ball back at that point. They did. And you went back and looked at it, and you could see that it wasn't. At first, it looked like it was off his forehead. Then you realized one of their guys swiped it with his finger. Right. And so they made the right call, 
And that was critical, critical to Arkansas winning the game. So they got one right and they got one wrong. Yeah, and I also noticed, like you said earlier, in, during NCAA tournament time, you get more more foul calls just because they don't want to mess anything up, right? I feel like they, <laughs> yeah. they just want to make sure they are doing everything right because this is when all eyes are on them, right? This is when every it single eye you got on It is a big deal to, to get them. to be able to officiate in the big dance. Exactly, exactly, Mike. Uh, on the fan board, Cats Illustrated IA slash UK fan Fan asks, if Cal is fired or resigns, who are legitimate options to replace him? Uh, Bennett from Virginia comes to mind, or Pearl Musselman as a last resort. Patino. Yeah, this is absolutely hilarious. And it's hilarious because <laughs> after Arkansas beat Kentucky, if you went on some of those Kentucky fan boards, they were just dogging Musselman down on him. He Very was terrible. Bad. Very you know, bad. didn't compare to the great coaches they've had over the years. <laughs> and so all it takes is for them to get bounced out of the NCAA tournament by, by a 15 seed. And all of a sudden, Musselman doesn't look so bad to them. No, no, he looks great. Yeah, so I don't think he'd be interested in going there, especially if he reads all the stuff they were saying about him earlier. Yeah, yeah I, I don't know if I, I, I could uh, see Musselman saying, ah, I'll look at all of these bad, bad comments. No, I'll come. I'll come. Yeah. yeah. Kentucky's I, a place I would never want to go if I was a coach. He, <laughs> I knew you were going to say that, Mike. You. I knew you were going to say that. Well, Richard Rush says, I guarantee you 100% of everyone's bracket is blown. Is your bracket messed up, Mike? I don't do brackets, oh, and it's because okay. of this reason well, I stopped several <laughs> years ago when I realized that my wife could make out a better bracket than I could, and she doesn't know anything about basketball. Well, there you go. She just does random picks, and she was whipping me <laughs> all over the place. I'm going, this is ridiculous. There are so many uh, upsets, mm -hmm. and this year's worse than ever. Generally, it's bad. It's bad. the upsets have been confined to the first round, those first right. games, Friday and, and Thursday and Friday. This year we saw them continue into Saturday and Sunday. And even now, yeah, these there are teams getting to the Sweet 16 that I don't think anyone could I mean, have predicted. Auburn gets dodges, a, you know, and just goes right through their first opponent, and yeah. then all of a sudden they go up against a 10 seed Miami <laughs> and turn into idiots. Yeah. So, and, and you're watching that, and you're going, this isn't the Auburn that I watched all year. Yeah, they looked nope. like they were trying to throw the game. I'm not saying they were, yeah. but they they were taking horrible jump shots that missed the rim by that far and they right. were throwing up layups that were just looping up in the air and going nowhere and they were no spacing on defense. Didn't look like Auburn basketball, did it? It was terrible. Yeah, didn't it was look like crazy. that. <laughs> well, let's switch gears just a little bit to baseball now. H. McCamish yeah. wants to know, do you feel better about Ark's pitching after the Kentucky series? Last week you said that we were hitting the ball better, but the pitching took a dip before SEC well, play. Yeah, SEC I was, play I was waiting to see what the pitching would be like in SEC play because it's different. And it was really good. And yeah. I've got some graphics on that. Look at the weekend oh. rotation. Uh, the weekend rotation, a combined 10 and 2 on the season now. Connor Nolan went 6 and a third on Friday night, gave up six hits, one run, just two walks and seven strikeouts. Saturday, Hagan Smith went six innings, gave up five hits, three runs with three walks and seven strikeouts. Jackson Wiggins on Sunday had his best outing, six innings pitch, four hits, no runs, four walks, eight Ks. And look at the bullpen. Evan Taylor pitched on Friday and Sunday for a total of 2.2 innings, gave up just two hits, one run, no walks, two strikeouts. Brady Tiger pitched two innings in relief on Sunday, gave up one hit, no runs with no walks and a strikeout. Cole Ramage closed out game one going one inning, giving up two hits and a run, but with no walks and two strikeouts. And Zebulon Vermillion was just about perfect. He pitched three full innings, gave up no hits, no runs, a walk with five strikeouts. Wow. And if wow. you look at the combined on, on the, the uh, bullpen, eight and two-thirds innings of relief with five hits and two runs allowed, one walk and 10 Ks, yeah. that you, you will win most series if your bullpen is like that and if your starting pitching is like that. So I was worried for no reason. <laughs> you were worried for no reason. There you go. He admits it on the show here. Well, Hog in Iowa wants to know, since all reviews now go to Birmingham for a decision to be made, do those guys know what the call on the field was before they make their ruling? Yeah, I checked with, with, the, with Arkansas, and yes, all of those calls are done remotely. If you've ever wondered when yeah. the guys go in there and start looking, well, in basketball, they're actually looking and making a decision. Right. But in these other sports, like baseball and football, they're just in there communicating with some, in, in, our, in the SEC case, if you're an SEC team, it's in Birmingham. So they yeah. got some guys in Birmingham. <laughs> 
and they're telling them, okay, I'm reviewing this, and they tell them their decision, and then they go out and announce it. Now, I asked about this, and the guy acted like, well, of course. He said, <laughs> they're watching the game, so they know what the f call on the field was, so right. you generally would not have to tell them. But he said, I suppose if they were asleep over drinking a Coke or yeah, not paying attention know. and got a phone call, oh, we want you to review this. Well, what was the original call? He said, they're there to tell them. Exactly. But he, but he doesn't think that happened. So. <laughs> well, at least we have a little bit of confirmation on on how that works yeah, a, li a little bit. It's mostly by remote, mm -hmm. which oh. I think is silly. I think you ought to let the, the, the umpires, the referees, yeah. the people at the game, why are you letting somebody in a remote location? You think these, I, these people may be ex-officials or whatever, right. but I let the people at the game make that it, decision. Now, I talked to a guy about this, and he said the reason he thinks they do that is because if one ref who would make the decision mm -hmm. from looking at the review would overrule another ref, it might cause a little bit of friction yeah, there yeah. when they go back in the, in the dressing room that and they're sense. talking, they might not like each other. So <laughs> he, this way you can just say, well, this jerk in Birmingham. Right, so you can blame it on them, not, <laughs> not on the guys that you're working Nothing with. Nothing I can do about it. <laughs> not on anybody else on the crew. All right, to spring football where Oki Back says, is it relaxing to see the coaches out here for the third season with systems in place, the players working on their assignments and getting better? I prefer this type of program over the question marks four and five years ago, wondering if we were going to be be an SEC opponent or not next season? I only went to the first practice. Yeah. The other two I was working or doing right. something right. else. I, I, I don't make these assignments. I might have been <laughs> off one of those days. So I didn't see them all, just saw the first one. Okay. It, it was impressive. I mean, yeah. what you notice, what I noticed was there, were, there weren't a lot of screw-ups. Guys doing the wrong thing, getting told, go, no, go over here, no, you did that wrong. We, we didn't do this right. Everything seemed to go smoothly. Nice. And usually they don't the first uh, first few days of, of, of spring football. Yeah. So it looked like to me that these guys had done a lot of prep work, mental prep work before being out there, especially wide receivers. You've got new guys out there. Hazelwood's out right. there, transfer from Oklahoma. And he didn't run any wrong routes or get chewed out. In mm -hmm. fact, he... I read later that uh, in the second workout, he caught a couple of bombs, and nice. some of those other guys were looking good. So I'm looking forward to when spring break is over and they the, you know, they get back and start exactly. doing some more because one thing we want to watch is this race at quarterback and some other things out there, see how some of these portal people are looking because they will probably play. But man, we haven't seen enough yet to come to any big conclusions other right. than I think he's on track with what he said. It looked like to me that they really did their homework before they started those first three practices. Exactly, but it's, it is very early on. So it we have is. a lot of spring to go and a lot of time to go before football begins. About a story published in The Athletic that an anonymous high school five-star recruit has signed a million-dollar deal with an unspecified school's NIL collective. Razorbacks says this is getting ridiculous. Wild, wild west. Yeah, I saw that story, and I have yeah. a problem with it. First okay. of all, it's from anonymous sources. Right. It's an anonymous school and an anonymous player. How long are we going <laughs> to fall for this garbage? When I started in the media 51 years ago, and my dad mm -hmm. was a newspaper man, so before I ever did that, I understood basic rules of yeah, reporting. Yeah, yeah. You didn't, sources didn't work that way. You had to have three independent, if they were anonymous, yeah. what they wanted you to do, your management people, is they wanted people on the record to say, what? This is what happened. That's how I was taught. <laughs> but if you had to use anonymous sources, there had to be three of them, not mm -hmm. one, and they had to not know each other. So there was no way they each got together and said, gotcha. hey, let's yeah. tell hey, this guy yeah. this story. Because I'm absolutely certain that some of these anonymous sources are telling people stuff because they want a certain point to get across. Yeah. You know, so what would be the point here? There's been, one thing, it gets you clicks because uh, football fans everywhere are freaking out over these NIL, this <laughs> NIL money. They all believe that you're going to start buying players, that the schools right. with the big NIL money, are, they're the ones who are going to grab all the players. And it didn't help when a the story broke on A&M yeah. buying the number one recruiting class. We still don't know if that's true. Right. That was a story that was reported based on sources. The problem I have with this particular story is if you start reading some of the details, this guy is going to get, if he stays four years, a total of $7 million. Mm -hmm. But then they broke down the payout, 
And at one point they started talking about he gets this money immediately, he's still in high school. He gets paid money, a lesser amount, but money from now until he enrolls. Wow. That's one of the few rules about NIL that's that illegal. They have. You yeah. can't do that. So you can bet that the NCAA will wait till this thing breaks when yes, it, and the yeah. names are attached to it and the school's name is attached. And then they're going to come in and start investigating that. Exactly. I've already been told by people familiar with NIL that the NCAA is already getting ready to start coming in because they believe they're violating one of the two rules. The yeah. one rule is pretty easy to figure out. You can't make your NIL based on performance. So yes. like if your NIL deal said you get this amount if you run for 25 touchdowns, if you run right. for only 14, you get this right. amount. That's pretty easy to check. But, but this whole thing about whether or not you offered a kid an NIL deals mm -hmm. and gave him the specifics while he was still being recruited before he signed a letter of yeah. intent, yeah. that's pretty, that's, that's a basic rule. Yeah. And I got to believe that the NCAA will be all over that trying to figure out mm -hmm. the ones that are breaking this rule. And I'm also told that there's going to be more rules. They're just kind of sitting that, back and I think that's what wait. I was about to say. Yeah, they're yeah. sitting back and trying to figure out what the abuses are, mm -hmm. and this would be a good example of an abuse, where right. you're just giving a guy an exorbitant amount of money. Mm -hmm. I think they're going to have to come, come up with some rules, and we will see that forthcoming, because if you don't do it, it's going to turn college athletics into complete nutsville. Right. Well, there's so many gray areas right now. We talked about the rules that are very easy to figure out, but there's so much gray area that you can't just throw it at athletes and say, okay, have fun, you know, it's there's a lot of stuff that's going to come out. All the stuff where you're getting an individual agent, exactly. you are getting an agent, and then he's going to go out and try to work the yep, NIL yep, deals for yep. you. Yeah, and you People can't have NIL deals. People complain about Jimmy deals, Sexton yeah. and, 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 you know, <laughs> Sam Pittman. Well, what about a player that has an agent? Right. I mean, come right. on. So it's getting a little weird to me, and I, I got to believe there'll be some more rules. Definitely. I definitely think you are right on that one. Hogfan46 says, I think Hornsby could be a great weapon for us, aside from purely a QB. Utilizing him as a hybrid, a combo of Debo Samuel and Taysom Hill would utilize all of his skills. With his speed, he needs several touches a game, and we should get creative making that happen. Thoughts? If they're going to do that, they haven't said anything specific. Mm. Uh, he was out with some sort of, I don't know if it was an injury or whatever. I mm. do know he wasn't out there for the, and will probably be back. But my, my guess is, I've been told he wants to be a quarterback. And okay. he, he's got, if he wants that, this spring is very critical for him because he's got Lucas Coley breathing down his yeah. back to be that number two quarterback. For so sure. if he wants to be the number two guy, he's got to be a quarterback. And that doesn't help if you're out there trying to do a bunch of other stuff. I'm not <laughs> saying that's not going to happen. I'm not saying it's a bad idea. Although I have t t had people tell me that some of these things that they think he would be good at, he's not good at. Mm. You know, okay. and I've talked about this before. He's got really good, he's a track guy. Yeah. He's got really good straight line speed. If he sees a lane or an opening, he can blow through that hole and go. Right. But he's not as good when he has to move laterally. That's where Coley has an advantage because he can, he's can he got quick feet and he can move and find openings and go in and out. Mm -hmm. So, again, it's one thing to say, this guy's fast, and therefore he can do this, 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 and that. It's not always true. Right. It's not always true when you deal with the actual athlete on the field. Right, and we haven't seen that so far no, in any there, of the practices or no, anything. No, there's him no that evidence utilizing. that they're going to do that so far. Right, right. Well, at Mousetown wants to know, is John Chavis back in coaching, or is that just a rumor? Supposedly the story on him at Arkansas was that he was just trying to build his retirement up, and he wasn't really into coaching anymore after a long career. Did he run out of money? <laughs> well, first of all, those stories about he just was trying to get some retirement, that was people mad at what was going on there. The problems with Arkansas under Chad Morris started with offense. Now, I'm not mm -hmm. saying eventually it didn't creep over onto the defensive side, but here's my view of that whole two-year period. I think if you go back and look, initially the defense was pretty good. Mm -hmm. They might have had some inconsistencies from game to game, but it was the offense that was terrible. And also, we know from from talking to some of those players right after uh, Morris left, 
they didn't say this while it was going on. Obviously, mm -hmm. players aren't going to do that. But so many of them said, we kind of we kind of learned this guy was full of it pretty <laughs> early. He just he'd tell us stuff, and we're going like, that doesn't make any sense. They didn't believe in him. Okay. Well, that was him. And that was on the offensive side. The quarterback's coach wasn't getting the job done. That's where the problems were. Mm. I think the problems on the defensive side developed later. And I think by that time, Chavis was frustrated. Yeah. And I think the players were, were probably tuning him out the way they started early on, tuning some of those offensive coaches out. Oof. Now, he's going to be the defensive coordinator and the linebackers coach for the Birmingham Stallions of the USFL. Mm -hmm. So if you want to watch and see what he does and be successful go. or whatever, but I got to believe that he came back into coaching because he wanted to coach, not because he was broke. Yeah, we'll yeah, see. exactly. We'll, we'll have to see how that goes for him. Blood Red Hog says Kevin Kelly quit as head coach at Presbyterian College less than a year into the job. Do you know why does he plan to coach again? If you just look at what happened, you would say the why is, you know, he, he jumps from a high school level to a college level, and the reputation he had as a coach was high-scoring offense. I mean, just scoring right, a right. lot of games, a lot of points. And he's the guy that would never punt, mm -hmm. and it never yeah. seemed to hurt him because, I mean, <laughs> you're scoring so many points. Who cares if it, screw, if it blows back, backfires on you a yeah. couple of times in a game? Yeah. So it started off great. Uh, his first two games, they won 84-43 yeah. and 68-3. So you're thinking, wow, okay. Not this bad. guy just jumped not into, uh, and that is a Division One school, by the way. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is. So oh. it's not just some peanut school with no <laughs> rules. And uh, so that looked great. But then everything started going the other way. From that point, they went. They lost seventy-two to nothing, sixty-three to forty-three, seventy to thirty-five. Wow. And it went on and on and yeah. on. And I think they ended up two and nine. Oof. Now. You might think, well, that's why he left. Well, I'm told that he's told people that's not why he left. Okay. He knew he was going to have to do a rebuilding job. He didn't like the transfer portal. Yeah. We're seeing that trend. <laughs> when you get to that level and you realize how that works in the portal, how mm -hmm. e easy it is to jump, you can't necessarily do that in high school. You can jump, but there are some things you have to clear to make that right, happen. Right. It's just totally easy on, the, on yeah. the college level. I was about to say, it's not as easy. And he told some people, look, so let's say I develop this team mm -hmm. and I take some, some below average athletes that they have and I coach them up and we get better. Yeah. What's going to happen? As soon as they, they're more marketable, they're going to go where they can get better NIL money. And he felt like the school wasn't doing their part to keep these guys there with NIL money and there were some other things with scholarships or whatever. So. Uh, apparently, he just said he didn't feel like this, the Presbyterian College itself was committed the way they said they were to helping uh, rebuild that program. Now, what's he going to do now? I'm told that he makes about as much money in coaching clinics as he did in coaching because oh, he's wow. in such demand. Yeah. Because his offense is amazing. Yep. So everybody wants to sit down and listen to him and find out how he does find what he does, does, listen to that philosophy. So he's doing okay there. But they also believe that he will eventually get back into coaching. Now, here's my unsolicited advice to him. Okay. You, you did too much at one time. Mm -hmm. I've studied high school coaches that may, went to the college level as a head coach. Yeah. It's a mistake. You look at the, some of the ones that have been successful, like Gus Malzahn, he didn't go from high, head coach to head coach. He was an assistant coach at Arkansas, yeah. at Tulsa at Auburn and then became a head coach at Arkansas State right. and then went back to Auburn and now he's over at uh, Central Florida. Mm -hmm. So that's what generally works. There was a guy years ago, like 40, 30, 40 years ago. His name was uh, Gary Faust, I think, mm. and he was at Moeller High School in Cincinnati and he won an unbelievable number of games. Wow. And Notre Dame hired him <laughs> right out of high school <laughs> to, to coach at Notre Dame and it was a disaster. Yeah. And yeah. so he was yeah. very quickly let go. Yeah. So, again, my advice to him is if you want to get back into coaching and you want to be at the college level, become somebody's coordinator. Yeah, yeah. You start, might start, start at small. a smaller school, yeah. go to a bigger school, get to a power five, good, get you a good coordinator's job eventually. And then along the way, you're watching the head coaches you work for do their job. Exactly. Sam Pittman said the way he learned to be a head coach was under Kirby Smart, watching what he did. And, yeah. you, and you look at a lot of the things that Pittman is doing at Arkansas, it was already being done at Georgia, including yeah. the way he recruits. Yeah. And the philosophy of all of his coaches have to be able to recruit or they're out the door. Yeah. So that's what I would advise him to do. 
you know, become a coordinator, even if you have to become a position coach, but then yeah. get a coordinator's job and then start moving up and then at some and point. Learn, and learn from someone. Some learn become a head coach too. at that point. Right, right. Uh, well, finally, Lanny asks, do you have any funny stories from your coverage of the NCAA basketball tournament over the years? Uh, I'm, I'm sure you do, Mike, and you have one, I'm sure. Yeah, I got more than I can probably <laughs> tell, but this is a good one. Okay. This is from the 1990 Midwest Regionals and the finals in Old Reunion Arena in Dallas. And okay. it's Arkansas and Texas. The winner goes to the Final Four in Denver. All right. So it's a big deal. Yeah. And Arkansas is ahead in that game late. Uh, Texas is at a, one of those, we, we all see it, they're at the point where they've got to either force a turnover or the clock's going to run out. And so a guy named Travis Mays, who was a great player for Texas, he was averaging 24 points a game that season. He's got four fouls, and he tries to steal the ball from Ron Heary, and he gets called for a foul, so it's his fifth foul, and he's on the bench. <laughs> so we're over there on press row, and there is a Texas guy. I'm not going to say who he was. Okay. I don't want to embarrass him this bad. Uh, <laughs> but there's a Texas guy over there, and he says very loudly where all of us can hear. He almost starts crying, and he goes, where is the justice in this? He said, Travis Mays, who is a wonderful human being, is over here with his head down, crying out of the game, and Arkansas has a convict out there shooting free throws. <laughs> so when the game was over, we all go in and we're interviewing Arkansas. So one of these guys goes in there and starts telling Ron Urey what he said. He said, you know, that's libelous. He's calling yeah. you a convict. Yeah. I don't think you've ever been you know, sent to prison or anything, so I don't know how he could say that. Thinking maybe, you know, he's going to file a lawsuit against yeah. this guy. And Ron Heary just goes, I'm not going to do that. He said, I think it's funny. <laughs> so he got accused of being a convict, shooting free throws to win the game, well, which okay. he did. And All Arkansas right. did well. go on to the Final Four. <laughs> but he got accused of being a convict, which, yeah, you that's know. That's a weird comment. I was like, convict? I don't see him wearing stripes right. out there. He yeah, he doesn't have I any ankle bracelets. I'm, not, I'm yeah. not aware that he was in prison at any point. <laughs> Oh, that's a great story. Well, that's all the time we have on uh, this edition of Ask Mike for, Court, er, for Mike Irwin. I'm Courtney Mills. We'll see you next Monday.